Welcome to Chapter 12 Continued. This is Agricultural Solutions and how can we pr produce food more sustainably is what we're going to be talking about today. Sustainable food production will require reducing topsoil erosion, eliminating overgrazing and overfishing, irrigating more efficiently, using IPM, promoting agrobiodiversity, and providing government subsidies for more sustainable farming, fishing, and aquaculture. And um, producing enough food to feed the rapidly growing human population will require growing crops in a mix of monocultures and polycultures and decreasing the enormous environmental impacts of industrialized food production. Okay, so the first thing we're talking about is how we can possibly reduce soil erosion because it takes probably, it could take hundreds to thousands of years to actually get um, mature soil and get all the different levels and horizons that we learned about last semester. Um, in order to get that loamy soil, it's, it's rare that soil is already loamy anyway. You've seen the different types of textures based on the different um, areas and regions of the world that you live in. Uh, so that's why it's really important to conserve the soil we do have because it takes so long to form. So some things that they're looking at, um, one way is to use a farming practice called terracing. You see terracing pretty much, you take a steep slope and you, you uh, create these wide bands and that helps to prevent uh, and thwart off water erosion. Um, another method is contour planting. Um, with contour planting, you pretty much are going to plow and harvest, there we go, plow and harvest um, using the contours and the topography of the land. So you're going to go parallel with the curve and the curvature of the land here. Um, in this picture, you also see something called strip cropping. And with strip cropping, you're basically planting alternating strips of a, a, a row crop. And then right next to it, you're going to try to plant a ground cover type of crop, something that's going to help, again, with the reduction of um, exposure of the soil, which will help prevent the water erosion. So you're going to want to plant something like corn or cotton, which is a row crop, and then next to that you want to plant something like alfalfa, clover, uh, rye, and some kind of legume mixture perhaps, and that will kind of help with the coverage. Another one is strip cropping with a cover crop. Um, and with strip cropping, you're pretty much planting... Um, oopsie, I'm sorry, alley cropping, sorry, or agroforestry. Uh, with alley cropping, you are going to be using the rows that are already there to kind of add um, a different crop as well. Basically, you're going to use trees, tall trees, to provide shade and reducing some of the um, water loss through evaporation because that shade will help the plants that are... Um, prevent them from getting hit completely by the sunlight to help retain their water um, and help with the transpiration and keep that soil nice and moist as well. And then, um, by the way, it's also called agroforestry. So some textbooks don't even use alley cropping. They just say agroforestry. But um, the trees can, you know, they can be providing fruit. They can provide fuel wood. And you can use, use the trimmings for mulch. And then you can even use it for um, livestock if you want to. Use the leftover... Um, trimmings, the green, we call it green manure. You can use that for as feed for livestock. Um, another, that's kind of similar to, um, wait, our windbreaks here. There's alley cropping. It's very similar to windbreaks. This is windbreaks. And basically with your windbreaks, it's very similar to alley cropping in that you're using the trees, but notice that the entire field is surrounded by the um, shelter, shelter belts. So windbreaks also called a shelter belt. And this is, again, to help reduce wind erosion. And, again, it also helps retain soil moisture and supplies wood and cre helps create um, increased crop productivity, probably about 5%, 10%. And then it even, this is where we can bring in, we'll talk about again a little bit, I know you read about it already, um, when we talk about alternative to pesticides, we can, this will provide habitats for some of the birds and some of the pest-eating uh, pollinating insects and such that can help control their pest population, so perhaps they'll have to use less uh, pesticide. So um, some solutions um, to use a mixture of monoculture crops planted in strips on the farm. Um, that's basically also similar to um, intercropping. So basically you're going to plant two or more crops in the same field at the same time. And this is, can, this is very beneficial for different reasons. You can promote like a synergistic interaction. Um, for example, corn, it needs a lot of nitrogen. It can be planted along with peas. And peas actually have, um, since they're kind of a legume, they do more of a nitrogen fixation with the soil. So those two together um, act in a 
you know, synergistic effect. Or you can even do it kind of a crop rotation style where one season you crop, uh, you plant one, and then the next season you plant the other. So one season you plant your corn, and the next season you, you plant your peas, and it'll kind of do the same thing as far as, um, like, the, the peas are going to leave excess nitrogen in the soil for the next season when the corn is planted there. So that's good. Another reason it's good to have um, a mixture of monocultures is that if you do have a pest species that happens to like one, maybe you'll get lucky and it won't like the other. So you're not left with absolutely no harvest uh, when that time comes. Okay, so another solution to preserving our soil uh, is to use low till or um, low tillage, no tillage. Traditional tillage you see on the far left, pretty much the reason that the conventional agriculture relies on the plowing and tilling is because they're physically actually turning the soil upside down and they're pushing the crop residues under the topsoil and by doing that you can kill weeds and the insect pupae that are already there. Now if you're going to use low tillage or no tillage you see that there's going to be a lot of debris left behind and that is usually like a, a breeding ground for um, the the pupae, if you will, and other um, other pests. So you do end up using a little bit more herbicide um, in order to kill the um, the pests that are there. But um, they say that it is still very helpful to try to do that, and it helps because when you disturb the soil and and you plow continuously, basically you are going to um, all that soil that was attached to the other soil particles or plant roots, it's going to get disturbed, broken apart, and then it's become more susceptible to erosion. Plus, repeated plowing in increases exposure to uh, of that organic matter that's deep in the soil to oxygen and unfortunately that's going to lead to oxidation of organic matter reducing organic matter and increasing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so it's really better to leave it um leave it untouched and let it sit and um just basically allow the soil to um kind of replenish itself and allow the roots to remain intact and that way you can kind of uh, reduce the wind and water erosion for the undisturbed soil so anyway, so it's beneficial. Um, natural capital degradation. Basically, this is just to show you again uh, the areas where the soil or soil um, has been extremely disturbed, um, and this happens already in regions that are more arid anyway. And so the hot spots are pretty much going to be um, areas that are arid and already surrounding deserts, um, or where there's just really really poor farming practices in place. And also, just keep in mind, another thing we talked about was just the effect of global warming, uh, the human-caused global warming, that we are intensifying this effect rapidly. All right, case study, soil erosion in the United States, learning from the past. So what happened in the Dust Bowl in the 1930s? <clears throat> well, uh, basically, from the 1920s and 1930s, the, in Midwestern United States, they really converted a good chunk of the native grasslands into wheat fields. And because the wheat fields are more susceptible to soil erosion by when the native grasslands, this conversion, pretty much produced many more hectares of erodible land. Um, so basically they had poor cultivation practices and um, overgrazing as well, combined with a severe and prolonged drought created a decade of crop failures. Now, if you don't have these crops alive and in place, uh, then the soil is also going to be loose. So the drought led to massive dust storms, uh, pretty much in a nutshell. Um, and this dust storm was so severe that the sun was entirely blocked out in the southern Great Plains, and they called it Black Sunday. And then topsoil from the dust storms traveled as far as D.C., and then um, that's why they called it the Dust Bowl. And then even in Georgia, um, they say that the laundry that was hung out to dry by women in the state of Georgia, it actually was covered with dust all the way bloom from the Midwest as well. Um, so they, people end up having to move. They moved to the east, west. Um, 1935, the Soil Erosion Act. Now, that was put in place. That was established um, as part of the USDA. And basically, they created these soil conservation districts, and they were formed throughout the country. And farmers and ranchers were given technical assistance, or in other words, subsidies, to set up soil conservation programs. So now they call the SCS, the, the um, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, so really, of the world's major food producing nations, U.S. is sharply reducing the soil losses because of the conservation tilling, et cetera, and then also government-sponsored soil programs. But um, more soil conservation is needed, and the effect of soil conservation um, is only practiced on half of U.S. agricultural land. 
And lately also with the rise of ethanol, the need for ethanol, the farmers are going to use that erodible land out of the conservation reserve to get the other government subsidies that are out there for planting corn in order to make ethanol for motor vehicle fuel. Um, here is an example of the hardest hit areas. Okay, pesticides. Nature controls the population of most pests. So in natural ecosystems and, and other polyculture agroecosystems, you have natural enemies such as your predators, parasites, disease organisms. Uh, they're controlling the pests. Uh, so basically what happens, for example, um, one of the world's 30,000 known spi species of spiders called the wolf spider, Woo. Uh, they actually kill far more insects every year than humans do by using um, chemicals. So unfortunately, what's happening, we're dousing um, areas with pesticides. We accidentally uh, kill the predator to pests. Um, so basically, we're upsetting the natural population checks and balances that are implementing the population control and our one of our principles of sustainability. And then we have to... Um, come up with new ways to create new pesticides and we're basically protecting the monoculture crops which is not natural uh, tree plantations lawns and golf courses we're trying to protect them from insects and gnats and skeeters and other pests that nature wants controlled for us okay so we try to use pesticides to control pest population the generic term for pesticide it's any chemical that's used to kill or control populations of organisms that humans consider undesirable which also is um, I guess subjective what you would you and I might differ on what we think is uh, a weed versus what we think is a lovely blooming flower uh, but the common types of pesticides are insecticides which you can guess kills insects herbicides which are weed killers fungicides which kill fungus and then rodenticides uh, these kill rats but these all four are a blanket term um, pesticides is the umbrella for insecticides herbicides fungicides and rodenticides a lot of people think they see pesticide and assume it's just for something living like you're getting rid of the insects but it actually is uh, encompasses all four of those um, anyway, so they did a study and they showed that pesticide use has not reduced U.S. crop loss to pests. Loss of crops is about 31%, even with a 33-fold um, increase in pesticide use. Okay, so there's a few different categories of pesticides. Uh, first, you have something called broad-spectrum pesticide, and basically that means that that'll kill many different types of pests, uh, whereas and some are selective, and those pesticides are going to basically focus on a narrow range of organisms. Um, another thing to consider is that you have first-generation pesticides, and those are ones that are natural, mainly natural chemicals, and those are borrowed from plants. Um, farmers, when they developed these, were basically trying to copy nature, but then there was this major pest control revolution in about 1939, and an entomologist, which is someone who studies um, insects, that Paul Mueller, he discovered DDT, a chemical um, that they had around since 1874, but he realized it was a, a potent insecticide. So DDT was the first of the so-called second generation pesticides, and um, they actually produced it in a lab, and he w received the Nobel Peace Prize for, for that discovery. But then you remember that Rachel Carson, a uh, marine biologist, um, started realizing that the um, tertiary consumers or the, um, you know, the, the, the bird population was decreasing, even though that wasn't her original area of study. Um, lastly, the pesticides, they vary in uh, their persistence, which is basically the length of time they remain deadly in the environment. Um, some, like the DDT, are the ones that are, um, they are magnified through bioaccumulation. It basically ends up over time and it becomes uh, more prevalent in the fatty tissues of the predators um, because it's fat soluble and it's not flush from the body. So if you eat an organism that contains the pesticide, then the chemicals transfer to that consumer, and eventually you're gonna have a really high pesticide concentration um, at the higher trophic levels. Um, then there's also non-persistent, which basically means it breaks down relatively rapidly within weeks to months, and that is one of the most common herbicides that you've probably even heard of before. Um, 
the trade name is Roundup, but it's glyphosate, and that one actually does break down rapidly, uh, but they have to be applied more often on the flip side, so the overall environmental impact isn't always lower than that of the persistent pesticide. Um, and of course, there's the always the um, pesticide treadmill that we've talked about, how the pesticide um, ends up um, be, being resistant to the pesticide, and it just goes on and on with the trying to, the scientists trying to develop a pesticide as fast as the pesticide is resisting it. Okay, so let's talk about trade-offs. Um, conventional pesticides, the advantages is that it can save lives. Um, it has been known to decrease, obviously, mosquitoes. So therefore, the um, mosquitoes are a vector for many, many diseases. And therefore, if you kill the mosquito, you're going to lose the transmission of uh, diseases such as malaria. Um, it increases food supplies, um, profitable, work fast, and they're safe if you use them prof uh, properly. Now, some dis disadvantages, they pr promote genetic resistance, the, the treadmill. Uh, it kills natural pest enemies like the wolf spider. Um, they can pollute the environment, get into the water system, into the waterways, can harm wildlife and people, um, and then are expensive for farmers to apply. Now, as far as um, harming wildlife and people goes, um, it really is threatening to the human health. There are a lot of workers who work in the fields. Um, they end up getting sick. There has been higher uh, rates of cancer because of the exposure to legally allowed pesticide residue in food. So but they said there's been about 4,000 to 20,000 cases of cancer per year in the U.S. Um, and so then people are concerned about, some scientists are concerned about the possibility of genetic mutations, birth defects, nervous system and behavior disorders, and effects on immune and endocrine systems from long-term exposure. So again, just uh, we need to learn how to wash our fruit, what we can do, reduce exposure to pesticides, grow some of your own food using organic methods, buy organic, wash and scrub our fruits, fresh fruits, vegetables, and wild foods you pick. I use, um, I use a little vinegar solution when I wash my fruits, eat less or no meat, and then trim the fat from the meat. Because like we said, a lot of these toxins are fat soluble um, and they bioaccumulate in the fat. So if you, the more fat you're trimming, the less you are going to consume. Uh, alternatives to using pesticides, and we've already talked about it, so full the pests. Essentially, you are just going to uh, trade out your crops, rotate your crops. So if you have a pest that um, liked your crop in particular, well, then next year, if you change your crop out, then you're going to uh, keep them away from the food that they thought they had. Uh, to provide homes for pest enemies, basically you are going to maybe plant a tree that you know will attract a predator of the pest that you don't like. Um, you can implant genetic resistance or use a, you know genetic engineering because there's a lot of plants that are already more uh, drought resistant. They are more tolerant to um, different weather conditions and they're more tolerant to different um, being eaten from the pests. Um, bring in natural enemies. Um, that's basically using biological controls, but of course, be mindful that this can't should not be an invasive uh, control. And then you also have to keep in mind that it's harder to control uh, an animal or an organism than it is the amount of quantity that you are spraying of pesticides. So you have to be careful about that as well. And then you can use insect perfume, um, which is basically a pheromone, which is a sex um, hormone. And the chemicals are supposed to just track one kind of species um, and are kind of expensive, but at the same time, um, it's because you get the you know, identify and isolate and produce that sex attractant. But at the same time, it's actually um, good because it, it has a little chance of uh, causing a genetic resistance and they're not harmful to the non-target species. Or you can bring in hormones and some of the hormones, what happens is it will, it might take a little bit while, to, a little longer to actually kill the pest, but they're nice because um, what you do is you basically, it interrupts the pest's normal life cycle and then it prevents it from actually uh, reaching maturity and reproducing. So it has some of the same advantages of the sex attractants, but like again, I said it takes a little bit longer. Then you can always scald them. Basically you spray them down with hot water and it works pretty good on cotton and alfalfa and then potato fields. In the United States we've been using it in our citrus groves, but you gotta think about how much uh, energy it costs to heat up that kind of water. 
to heat it up to a temperature that will actually scald. Okay, IPM, integrated pest management. This takes a lot more money on up front or a lot more research and time and careful consideration, but it's actually a, a combination of using um, uh, traditional and conventional agricultural methods and methodologies. Um, it helps to know the, the different soil types that are in your area, the climate, the drought conditions. Um, it's helpful to know the different types of species that um, are will proliferate in your area. Um, and it's been very successful. Your book says that Indonesia has had a 15% increase in their rice production and they have decreased their um, pesticide use significantly. So therefore, they're saving money on the amount of pesticides that they are uh, going to have to apply. Um, and basically, they try to use just small amounts of insecticides and they're trying to use the one that are more natural. And that's only as a last resort. Um, and they tr do not use the broad spectrum long-lived pesticides um, and then they use different chemicals alternately to try to slow it down. Um, let's see, Ooh, your guide to pesticides and produce. So this is just another little picture real quick of uh, if you need to save money on um, your produce then on organic food then perhaps you want to um, purchase the top column, I'm sorry, the top row, organic, especially those apples and potatoes. Remember, potatoes are roots, so they're, therefore they're drawing up uh, the toxins firsthand straight from the soil. And apples, just you want to peel those, the, the um, skin off as much as possible. Strawberries, very fleshy. Um, but if you've got a nice skin on it, usually that's one of the rules of thumb. If you have a nice skin, then usually that helps protect. Okay, you can restore soil fertility, replace the fertilizer by using organic fertilizers. So um, animal manure, basically that's dung and urine of cattle, horses, poultry, and other farm animals, and that helps to improve soil structure. Um, another type, the green manure, is basically it's just the freshly cut growing green uh, vegetation, like your, um, you can just use your grass clippings and you can throw that in the compost pile if you want. Compost is pretty much all the organic matter um, that you, my, microorganisms basically break down and it can be leaves, the crop residue, like your grass, food wastes, um, paper, wood, and then in the presence of oxygen, this is done, this is aerobic bacteria will break it down. Um, if you're going to do one close to home, though, I would suggest not putting too much of your dairy in it if you're doing a compost in a closed structure in your garage or whatnot for your um, small garden. Uh, if you want to minimize the dairy, that'll keep the stink away. Uh, but there's a lot of plants that, you know, are going to deplete nutrients more than others, so just be careful what you're planting. Um, some solutions for sustainable or sustainable organic agriculture, we're going to have more high yield polyculture. So in other words, you are going to use multiple crops instead of just one crop, a huge field of a monoculture. You're going to use more organic fertilizers that we just mentioned, biological pest controls, IPM, efficient irrigation. So you're not going to use the gully method where you just douse um, and hope that the roots that you are intending it for uh, will get that water. You are going to use... Um, Perennial crops, um, perennial crops I'll talk about more in a minute, but they have a much, much larger root system and they don't need to be um, harvested and then replanted year to year. So it gives them more time to settle and to um, set up their, um, their root system and therefore they can spend more time the next year developing their leaves and their fruit. Crop rotation. Um, again, we talked about the corn and the peas, which help one help with nitrogen fixation. Uh, water efficient crops, so some areas might need less alfalfa. Do more soil conservation. Subsidies for sustainable farming and fishing, and perhaps less subsidies for the manufacturing of corn. Okay, and then we need to do less soil erosion, aquifer depletion, overgrazing, overfishing, losing our biodiversity, wasting food, uh, allowing subsidies for unsustainable farming and fishing. Uh, soil salinization, in other words, overwatering in areas that are arid so that the rapid evaporation rate leaves behind the salts. Uh, we need to have less population growth and less poverty. 
Organic farming improves soil fertility, reduces soil erosion, retains more water, soil, and soil during drought years, uh, uses about 30% less energy per unit of field, lowers carbon dioxide emissions. Remember here, you're going to basically, uh, if we talk about right here, you're going to be using less machinery and you are going to be using a lot more manpower. Therefore, you're going to have, um, it's going to be more expensive because labor is more expensive um, and it's going to be more expensive because you are going to be producing less quantity because you have a smaller area in order to actually be able to um, get your crop. So it's going to be a little bit pricier, but the benefits should outweigh the cost because it's going to also, since you're not using these um, high input agriculture, you're going to have lower carbon dioxide emission. You will be reducing water pollution by recycling livestock wastes because uh, there's just enough waste to be used as fertilizer. Eliminates pollution from the pesticides because you're not using pesticides. Increases biodiversity above and below ground and benefits wildlife such as birds and bats because most of your organic farms also are uh, using polyculture. Okay, so polyculture is a perennial crops. Okay, so science focused. Sustainable polyculture is a perennial crops. So an annual plant such as wheat or corn will live basically one season and what happens is that your annual plants have to be replanted each year um, which basically causes the disruption in the soil and it causes the tilling and you're disrupting the roots. Um, however, if you have the perennial crop, these plants actually live for multiple years. Um, which is good because that means there's no need to plow the field each year and then you're also not ha leaving the field bare um, for periods of time. They have a longer growing season and they continue producing roots and storing energy after you harvest the um, top portion. So therefore they come up earlier in the spring than the annuals will. And then um, they rely on the root systems that are already in place and that way they can put a little bit more of their energy resource to producing stems and fruits and seeds and all those fun things that we actually are trying to harvest. But um, the characteristics will make them more productive than, annual, than the annuals. So what's going on here is that Wes Jackson, um, he's at the Land Institute and basically what they're doing is that they're trying to find ways to grow the crops um, that mimic the natural world. So they're trying to basically use a combination of conventional selective breeding and technology. So they're using a little bit of technology too. But they're attempting to convert the annual species like wheat and sorghum and sunflowers and corn into perennial crops. Um, but by doing this, so they're going to take wild perennials like wheatgrass, and then they're going to try to domesticate them and then they're going to basically select the ones that have like the higher seed yields and the you know the largest size and look like the best quality and they're going to use those and they're going to try to assemble a community of the um, that will actually be stable and productive and resistant to insect pests and disease so basically they're trying to develop sustainable crops that are going to produce sufficient amounts of food for harvest by humans and reduce soil erosion and reduce and hopefully eliminate the need for synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and irrigation. So they have been able to double the size of the seeds of the wheatgrass and increase its seed production. Um, of course, there's always, you know, a criticism to it, and they basically, the critics are saying that this is going to take so long, it's going to take decades to develop perennial seeds with act that actually are going to make usable products. But anyway, um, that's something that they're working on right now, and uh, hopefully in your lifetime you'll see that come about. And you see right here, this is just a comparison of the roots between an annual plant and a perennial plant. You could just see the, how, how awesome that root structure is and how that would actually m be much better for the soil and keeping the soil in place and intact. Um, and that's why you see all the time when uh, even on um, hills and slopes, uh, they try to get some, some plants on there and that's the best way to keep it from eroding away. The end.